Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 is now on digital! And I was able to find so many more easter eggs and clues and details that I missed the first time around. You may have noticed we always try to cover our bases with these re-breakdowns. We did this with Quantumania, The Incredible Hulk in the past month, and now with new info like James Gunn confirming that the High Evolutionary survived the events of the film, we just thought it'd be a good idea to go back and revisit it and all its heartbreakingly cute enhanced animal glory! Let's do this! Now I did some in-depth analysis of Volume 1 and Volume 2 on the Deep Dive channel. Check those out and hit that subscribe button, please, and thank you. Okay, this film opens with a Guardians of the Galaxy themed version of the Marvel Studios title card with moments from across their prior seven appearances in the MCU. We see famous script lines from the Guardians history, including Peter Quill's Showtime A-Holes, Quill's Some Unspoken Thing from Volume 1, Drax's There Are Two Types of People in the Universe, Those Who Dance and Those Who Do Not, Rocket's A Bunch of Jackasses Standing in a Circle from Volume 1, Groot's We Are Groot, Rocket's Ain't Nothing Like Me, Set me, which is really the perfect quote to set up the Rocket-centric movie we're about to watch. Speaking of Rocket and Groot, James Gunn posted some unused info on their backstories into his Threads account, linking back to Tibius Lark. Tibius Lark was listed as an associate of Rocket and Groot during the mugshot scene in Volume 1. He's not a Marvel Comics character, but rather an invention of James Gunn. Gunn intended to pay this off with a short film for this movie that was storyboarded but never shot. In the script, Lark was a space zookeeper who saved Groot from his zoo, but wound up getting them both thrown in prison with Rocket, Tibius would die and reveal that he was a robot. Rocket would then make a machine gun out of Tibius' body and escape with Groot, setting up why Rocket always wants people's body parts and can quick fashion weapons out of anything. Okay, moving on, the first image in yellow on the Marvel text is Rocket crying from the final shot of Volume 2. This movie is Rocket's heartbreaking story of his unique quality. The last thing we see before the images wipe away is the Guardians' first team-up shot in the kiln in Volume 1, reminding us how this all started. We get the beginning, and this film is going to show us the end of this team as we know it. So we fade in on a cage of scurrying baby raccoons, designed by VFX company Framestore. And they're so sweet, so adorable, their playfulness turns to terror as a high evolutionary slowly walks toward the cage. James Gunn stated that this is not Herbert Wyndham from the comics. Since Wyndham was from Earth, this character is an alien from another planet. Here, he remains out of focus with the cage itself in the foreground, allowing the viewer to experience what the kits are experiencing. Their ears fold down in fear as all of them, except for one, turn their backs and attempt to hide. Only 89P13 stays front and center. This sets up right away that there is something different about Rocket. The High Evolutionary reaches into the cage with his palm facing down, which is a threatening gesture that's known to trigger animals, so they suggest palm up. And then we get this cool effect where we push in on Rocket's nose in the fur warps into adult rocket because he has a different skull shape that was physically changed by the surgeries. So we transition to present day rocket on Nowhere, where we saw in the holiday special, the Guardians have settled on as their new home, along with some refugees. Although we should note, while Nowhere is taking in refugees, it seems like they didn't take in any scrolls, who, it's established in Secret Evasion, are still on the hunt for a permanent home. Whether that's because of xenophobia towards scrolls, or the scrolls never really considering Nowhere for some other reason, we don't know. Maybe some of the people walking around this planet are scrolls in disguise. Rocket sings along to an acoustic version of Radiohead's Creep on the Zune that originally belonged to Yondu, but was passed on to Peter by Kraglin after Yondu's death in Volume 2. Notice how we see Rocket turning up the music, and the amplifiers behind him begin pulsing intensely. It just makes perfect sense that Rocket, as an outcast who hates himself for what the High Evolutionary turned him into, would respond to this song, and he wants everyone in nowhere to hear his cry for help. It reminds us how he and Groot rigged up the Awesome Mix Volume 2 to play from speakers in the opening sequence of the second film. James Gunn always writes his track list into the scripts and he plays the music on set to inspire the actors. He justifies the music source in the context of the scene to make it diegetic so the songs aren't just randomly playing over everything, but really a choice a character made to play the song. Gunn has said that he feels like Rocket has always been the secret protagonist of these films and quote, one of the reasons why I came back to make this movie was because I felt like I needed to tell Rocket's story. I think he exemplifies a lot of the traits of all the Guardians. They all had these traumas and it brings them together. I just think his is more extreme than others. So this movie really is the story of Rocket's trauma. The Guardians aren't trying to save the entire galaxy. They're really just trying to save Rocket. And this movie explains why he needs saving. It's truly one of the most character focused MCU films to date. By saving one member of the Guardians of the Galaxy, they end up saving everything. As Rocket moves through nowhere, we see a few people dancing, and one of these is Mantis, who tries to get Drax to dance, but he says, Only idiots dance. This is an ongoing thing with Drax, since he said in Volume 2, There are two types of beings in the universe. Those who dance, 
than those who do not. Leading to my long running MCU theory that all Marvel characters are depicted as either dancers or non dancers. Nebula and Swole Groot raise a neon sign written in the Cree language. It translates to Guardians of the Galaxy, and we see that underneath it. This Groot has a different anatomy than Volume 1 Groot's adult form because that Groot was really his father. It's not his clone. And we have now seen Groot as a dancing baby, a troublesome little kid, and a moody teen. Now he's in his college jock stage of development. Groot is a floor colossus, and they feed on photonic knowledge gained from light sources. And since Groot has been in the company of beings like Quill and Mantis descended from a celestial, I have theorized that he could have absorbed their celestial light and grown more that way. Now, no word as of yet if any of that celestial light could have made it into the DNA source of Groot that the squirrels found and used in secret evasion. Nebula, you'll notice, has a new nanotech weave arm, which James Gunn confirmed was made for her by Rocket to thank her for gifting him Bucky's detached vibranium arm in the holiday special, which, by the way, we still have no idea how she got. I really don't think we're going to get an answer to that one, folks. Rocket walks into the nowhere bar where drunk Peter is still moping over Gamora. Rocket sips a drink from a container marked in Cree letters, translating to Milky Fizz. They actually had this drink available to buy in Disneyland on Avengers Campus. We get a classic Guardians walking toward the camera in slow motion with a cool song playing shot. This reminds us what the Guardian status quo is, with Kraglin wielding the Yondu Mohawk, Groot as a swole young adult, Cosmo rolling with the group, and Peter drunk and depressed thanks to the loss of his dimensions, Gamora, and Infinity War. And the fact that the cool song in question is a downbeat grunge classic as opposed to a late 70s AM radio banger that they usually use, it's just tipping us off that this is going to be a bit darker than the other Guardians movies. Nebula turns out Peter's bedroom light as written and directed by James Gunn pops up on screen, showing that he's really putting his trilogy to bed here. Now, nowhere is established with new coordinates M211, R516, XS, different than the Volume 1 coordinates, which were M3RD, 17H17211, plus 2121224. The fact that nowhere has different coordinates sets up the twist in the third act that the planet is, in fact, a mobile battle station able to be piloted. As Kraglin gets ready to practice his Yaka Arrow skills, we see that he's done this before. As one guy says, here we go. This actor is Stephen Blakehart, a standard in James Gunn movies. He played the same character in Volume 1 and in the Holiday Special, and he was Brawl in Volume 2. He was also in the Suicide Squad and Peacemaker, a bunch of other James Gunn stuff. Cosmo is voiced by Maria Bakalova and supporting a spacesuit with the CCCP logo, which stands for Central Committee of the Communist Party, as she is based on Laika, this poor space dog that was sent into space without any plan to bring that poor dog back. The group discusses Peter's emotional state while snacking on Roasted or Loney, which pop up all over the Guardians movies. We first saw one of these in the opening of Volume 1 when Peter kicked it during his lip-syncing performance. So now Adam Warlock speeds toward nowhere to the tune of Hearts Crazy on You. His cape flapping in the space wind. Capes are used in the MCU really to symbolize big egos. Kurt Russell, who plays a character literally named Ego, sports one. Loki has a cape in his first few appearances. Thor wears one, but ditches it in later movies as he becomes more of a team player. Vision synthesizes himself a cape in Age of Ultron after giving Thor a little side eye. So Adam Warlock really fits into this tradition nicely. The High Evolutionary will go on to say about Adam's people, Your egos have run wild. The bolt in Adam's head is a nod to the comics iteration carrying the soul gem in his forehead. He plays a major role in the Infinity Gauntlet storyline, but the MC really assigned that detail to Vision with the Mind Stone, but Gunn leaves in a little reminder of his origins here. After Warlock tackles Rocket to the ground, we see some neon lettering and Kree translating to U and K. Nebula uses her new arm tech to blast Warlock, earning her a dislocated jaw as he tosses her aside like a rag doll. Even Swole Groot doesn't stand a chance against him. Groot gets beheaded, but later sprouts branch legs out of his head, looking like the spider head form of the shapeshifter from John Carpenter's The Thing, which was starring Peter Quill's dad, Ego, Kurt Russell, Adam Warlock also snaps Mantis's arm like a pretzel stick, and then Drax gives him the same treatment that he just gave Nebula, tossing him into the newly erected Guardian sign and splitting it in half. Nebula uses her other feature on her new arm to stab him through the chest from the back, much like we saw Loki do to Coulson in Avengers. A mortally wounded Rocket flashes back to one of his enhancements at the hands of the High Evolutionary. And here we meet Lila, Tiefs, and Floor, in a scene that I think is reminiscent of the moment in the first Toy Story when Sid's broken toys come out. First frightening Buzz and Woody before it's revealed that they're just trying to help. Now Lila an otter creature is voiced by Linda Cardellini, who also plays Laura Barton in the MCU. Teeth's the walrus is voiced by Asim Chaudhry. And Floor, the rabbit, is voiced by Michaela Hoover, who also played Nova Prime's assistant in the first Guardians film. Little Rocket's first spoken word is... <laughs> 
and it's just so heartbreaking. Now, recently, James Gunn shared some sketches containing new details about Lila, Flor, and Teeps that their numbers are respectively 89Q12, 89J50, which was changed to 89L06, and for Teeps, 89A95. Along with Rocket, who is 89P13, they were part of Batch 89. We also see that originally the idea for Floor is that every time she talked, her mouth was going to scrape and cut herself, which is just so mean. As Lila tells Rocket, you're gonna be okay, we cut to the Guardian standing around him because they're really the ones who made him okay. The High Evolutionary installed a kill switch in Rocket, considering his parts proprietary technology. Groot has now reformed himself a bit, so he's able to stand again, you'll notice. We get a sense of the Guardian's new ship, the Bowie, which is named after David Bowie and following the pattern of naming ships after people who were famous when Peter was young. Like we saw the Milano in volume one and volume two named after Alyssa Milano, the Benatar in Infinity War and Endgame named after Pat Benatar. We hear rainbows since you've been gone playing on their way to Orgocorp. We see Arete Laboratories, a mobile research complex on counter earth, coordinates K20H, MW1748P2S, plus 5M5P0Z4. Aisha comforts Adam who says, it hurts. echoing little Rocket's first word, hurts and letting us know that Adam is still very much a little kid, despite having the adult body of Will Poulter. And we get our first look at the present day High Evolutionary, whose face is now stretched out and pulled over a metallic clip at his temple. So we know something has happened to him in the time since the flashbacks we've seen. The face we see is really another layer of wallpaper over whatever is underneath. In the comics, the High Evolutionary is Marvel's ultimate geneticist from Thor Comics in 1966, who played a role in the 2008 Annihilation Conquest storyline that these Guardians films are partially based on. Now, again, this this character isn't that high evolutionary because that one was Herbert Wyndham, but he was also known for creating the animal-human hybrids, the Animen and the New Men. Here he's played by Chiquiti Uiji, who of course James Gunn worked with on Peacemaker. The Guardians arrived at the Orgoscope at Orgocorp HQ coordinates A41P P2326 Y430 plus 174144V. This is the high evolutionary's corporate front for the cybernetic parts and implants used around the galaxy. Remember, Yondu knew scientists made Rocket, which tells us that the galaxy must know the High Evolutionary is and all about his experiments just kind of looks the other way. Drax is eating Zarg nuts and offers one to Peter, but doesn't offer any to Mantis who glares at him. Just love these little background details. There's a callback to the holiday special where Drax brings up her eating all the Zarg nuts in the commissary. He's still holding a grudge. Peter's wearing a red shirt with another Orloni on it, maybe a shirt from the roasted Orloni stand that we saw earlier. And he says, people on earth die when they're like 50. Are you about to die? I'm not 50. If you look closely at Drax, when Mantis asks if Peter's about to die, Drax nods. It's just another really fun background detail. The Guardians are boarded by the Ravagers, who alternate timeline Gamora from Avengers Endgame has joined. She and Nebula give each other a grunting nod. This is really how the sisters communicate throughout the movie. And now that we have the ability to pause at will, we will try to identify everyone in the scene. So we got Stakar Ogord, played by Sly Stallone, the robot mainframe, who's still looking very Cyberman from Doctor Who-esque, voiced by Miley Cyrus in the Guardians 2 post credit scene, but here voiced by Tara Strong the voice of Miss Minutes and Loki and Raven and Teen Titans Go. Also returning from the Guardians Volume 2 post credit scene, we have Martin X, a humanoid made of crystals, played by Michael Rosenbaum, and Kruger, who is wielding some Doctor Strange sling rings. In the comics, he's actually Sorcerer Supreme from Earth 691, an alternate 31st century reality. His Ravager badge on his chest has a green gem on it, which he might use as his own Eye of Agamotto. It wouldn't be a Time Stone since the Time Stone was atomized in this universe. Now, missing from the Guardians 2 post credit scene are Michelle Yeoh's Aleda and Ving Rhames, Charlie 27. These next folks are listed on IMDb, but their names aren't said aloud. We have Fitz Gibbonock, Ravager Molly, and then behind her, we have BD Ravager, who is the one with the beard. Then there's a blue guy who might be a Lufamoid, which is Nebula's race. Then we get this creepy guy who might be from the same planet as the Broker, because they seem to have some similar features. There's a couple humanoid looking dudes who are just frankly too well coiffed to be space pirates, if you ask me. If you know who they are or what planet they're from, let me know in the comments. Okay, the Orgocorp jumpsuits that the Guardians change into have a logo that looks like a flayed man, just evoking how Rocket look during his operation. Rocket flashes back to another memory with the High Evolutionary, and now that he's a little bit older, Rocket is once again voiced by Bradley Cooper. The transformation of the turtle test subject into a tube filled with smoke just might remind you of the transformation scene in The Incredible Hulk, where Bruce Banner's trapped in the glass room as it's filled with tear gas before he hulks out. The test subject here turns into a similar green monster with an anger problem. It also reminds me a lot of Terragenesis, in which the Terrigen mist is inhaled and causes the creature to mutate into a superpowered inhuman. We saw Terragenesis with the Inhumans TV show 
show also, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Space Hogs, in the meantime, plays as the Guardians float down toward the Orgo Corp in the colorful spacesuits, which James Gunn said in a tweet are supposed to invoke the spacesuits from 2001 A Space Odyssey. This is a planet made of living matter. It may remind fans of Ego, the living planet, with some tendon-like structures holding it together, looking like the ones inside Ego in the Guardians 2 final battle. Nebula wears the green suit, Gamora wears the blue one, showing us how they've really traded roles in the Guardians group since we were first introduced to the two of them. Nebula's arm cannon looks like it's made from the same tech as the Destroyer from the first Thor movie. Destroyer tech has popped up a lot in the MCU, including the gun that Coulson threatens Loki with before the shank that may or may not have been fatal, depending on whether or not you consider Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. to be canon. We've all got a certain amount of chores we've got to do, and we want them all to be as easy as possible, right? That's why we swapped out brooms for vacuums for Roombas. And it's the same reason you should try Clean My Mac X. Clean My Mac X is a one-click solution to get your Mac running like new. Think about it. What would you rather do? Spend hours of time going through system files, manually clearing the cache, finding junk or recovering infected files, or just click the smart scan and have Clean My Mac X do all that for you. Smart scan handles cleanup, protection, and system performance with one click of a button in just a few minutes. It's why Apple, you know, the people who make Macs, say we love how easy it is. And also why Clean My Mac X has over 27 million satisfied users. Clean My Mac X is one app for complete Mac care. Start your seven day free trial by clicking the link in the description below or use promo code new rockstars to get 25% off your order to get your Mac running like new today. We see frequent James Gunn player Nathan Fillion playing Master Karja in an outfit that makes him look like a big tardigrade, if you ask me. Fillion cameoed in volume one as a blue skinned alien in the kiln and cameoed in a deleted scene for volume two playing Wonder Man Simon Williams in movie posters and he has just been cast as Lantern Guy Gardner in James Gunn's upcoming Superman Legacy. And speaking of James Gunn's regulars, tons of them pop up in this movie. We already talked about Sylvester Stallone, who also provides the voice of King Shark in the Suicide Squad, the Orgo Corp security head, and Minister Quoll is a cameo by Jennifer Holland, James Gunn's wife, who also appeared in Peacemaker and in Black Adam. The Orgo Corp worker they forced to help them is Ura, played by Daniela Melchior, who played Rat Catcher 2 in the Suicide Squad. And yeah, we know Sean Gunn, he plays Kraglin, obviously James Gunn's brother, also played Weasel and Calendar Man in Suicide Squad. Gerardo Duvalia, who plays the Ravager of Fitzgibbonock, also popped up in the Suicide Squad as General Vera. D. Bradley Baker, who does the voice of Blurp, also provides animal voices for the Suicide Squad and Peacemaker. He was once the voice of Eagly, remember for Peacemaker? And then Ranaldo Faberle, who does the voice of Behemoth, also in the Suicide Squad, as one of the guerrilla fighters. Lloyd Kaufman, the founder of Troma Studios, where James Gunn got his start, appears in both the first Guardians of the Galaxy movies as a prisoner, and in this one, as Griddle Mop. There's also a deleted scene with Pete Davidson, who had a very memorable death in the Suicide Squad. Just James Gunn loves doing stuff like this, and he said that one or more Guardians can make their way into his DCU movies. He specifically said that he's been talking to Palm Clemente about an unspecified role. If there's any other gun regulars we missed, let us know in the comments. Peter tosses the 89P13 sphere like a baseball, just like he did with the orb in the 2014 film. Remember, he accidentally dropped it in that shot and they kept that take in. So Groot gets ready to pilot the ship and we hear Earth, Wind & Fire's reasons. We heard their song Shining Star in both Doctor Strange as well as the Daredevil Netflix series. Peter turns off the gravity for the soldier suits, a version of the sun rocket poles in the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie to get them out of the kiln prison. This shows that the Guardians have really been learning from each other's playbooks. Gamora says that the High Evolutionary created Zeronians, Animen, and the Sovereign. Remember, the Sovereign are Aisha's people, which explains why we never really knew what the Sovereign were or where they came from. Animen are the animal-human hybrids, and there are a few different iterations of them in the comics, but in one, they included the likes of Frogman and Ape Man. And then Zeronians are the pale skinned humanoids with plates that cover their mouths. We saw some of them with the Collector and Thor of the Dark Worlds post credit scene and in the background of all the Guardians of the Galaxy titles. In the comics, the Zeronians are really a peaceful race who can gain powers from solar radiation. So Adam Warlock adopts Blurp, the furry Fasaki sidekick, and the Ravager he accidentally fried. Now, furry Fasaki are carnivorous creatures about the size of the cat. And there was also a reptilian version that we saw in the Fighting Pit in the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie on Nowhere, feeding on Orlonis. Peter listens to the flaming lips, Do you realize? on his Zune, and we hear the line, we're floating in space, as they actually are floating in space. Faith No More's We Care A Lot plays as the Guardians arrive on Counter-Earth. Coordinates K20H, MW1748P2S, plus 5M5P0Z4. We see a dupe of the Statue of Liberty, but with the High Evolutionary holding a monkey, which is definitely reminiscent of the end of the 2001 Planet of the Apes movie by Tim Burton, where there's Lincoln Memorial as an ape. This baby in the stroller also has a High Evolutionary doll it's clinging to, showing that to them, the High Evolutionary is likely a benevolent 
violent figure instead of the monster we know him to be, and he's about to prove to all of them he is. The fashion and tech on Counter Earth suggests that they're culturally stuck somewhere in the late 70s or early 80s, which would have been around the time when Peter Quill left Earth. This is never explained, but we can assume that Counter Earth was created fairly recently and its inhabitants wouldn't be caught up to those of Standard Earth yet. But among these period details are this retro jogging suit and this tiny skateboard. Inside the Counter Earth home, we hear a song called Koinu no Carnival from the Minute Waltz by Ihamic. So this is produced by Vocaloid, which is a voice synthesizer software with over 15 Vocaloid creators represented here, including what sounds like Cosmo Howling. The house has many 80s flourishes as well. Like the alien kids play with retro looking toys. There's no alien Roblox in sight though. The family seems to have gotten their photo taken at some kind of counter earth version of the Sears portrait studio. There's a school portrait of one of the kids that has those neon lasers in the background that anyone who went to school during a certain era remembers. And of course there's this very 70s looking car that Peter commandeers. There's also some adorable animal themed wallpaper that's all over the walls. Literally every detail in this home is awesome. And speaking of the car, it is the reason for the MCU's first ever F-bomb. PG-13 movie like this is allowed to have just one. In an interview, James Gunn said it wasn't scripted, but something he suggested to Chris Pratt in the moment. Now Deadpool has, of course, used multiple F-bombs, but those first two movies were in the Fox Marvel universe and they were rated R. This is the MCU. The upcoming Deadpool 3, though, will be part of the MCU and rated R. So we can assume this movie's most F-bombs in an MCU record is gonna be broken and then some. Peter hands Groot his blasters and says, you know what to do with these. This will pay off later in the shootout in the High Evolutionary's base. As Peter tries to drive the car, the street sign cautioning drivers about pedestrians has animal heads instead of human heads. We hear Alice Cooper's I'm always chasing rainbows as Gamora checks out some of Peter's keepsakes from his childhood on Earth. We see some garbage pail kids cards, an action figure of Panthro from the Thundercats, a report card with C's and D's in every subject except PE where he got a B, and some ALF trading cards. Remember, ALF comics are are technically Marvel, and one of those comics showed up in I Am Groot in this backpack as well. Peter, Nebula, and Groot drive through the slums of Counter Earth, and we see a drug deal going down. The dealer is played by Dane Robert Deliagro, a basketball player turned actor who played the Predator in Prey. Test subject Phyla runs in a ring around the High Evolutionary, like the jogging sequence in 2001 A Space Odyssey. Phyla is played by Kai Zen and returns to the post credit scene. She's the MCU version of Phyla Vell, who becomes Quasar in the Annihilation Conquest storyline, the artificially created daughter of the Kree Marvel, and compared Companion to Drax's daughter, Moon Dragon. Based on her glowing eye in the post credit scene, it looks like her powers have the same Kree cosmic radiation source as Monica Rambeau, Kamala Khan, and Carol Danvers. And based on the latest trailer for the Marvels, maybe part of a new super team called the Annihilators. Peter and the others meet two mutant bruisers named Behemoth and Warpig, who reminded me of Bebop and Rocksteady from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Behemoth, like I mentioned earlier, is voiced by Reynaldo Faberle from the Suicide Squad. Warpig is hilariously voiced by the amazing character actor Judy Greer, who made her MCU debut as Maggie, Scott's ex wife and Ant-Man. Other actors who have played two characters in the MCU, one live action and one voiceover, include Linda Cardellini, who plays Lila and Laura Barton, Clancy Brown, who played Ray Schoonover and Daredevil and Searcher and Thor Ragnarok, Benedict Cumberbatch, who is both Doctor Strange and Dormammu in the same movie, and Chris Hemsworth, who of course plays Thor, and one of Hajo's three heads in Thor Ragnarok, and we should also mention Taika Waititi, who plays one of the other three heads, who also does Korg. Now, the way the High Evolutionary's purple suit lights up here looks an awful lot like the Scarlet Centurion version of Kang from the Quantumania post credit sequence, which just makes me wonder if these two might have crossed paths at any point on their supervillain journeys. After seeing different versions of the afterlife in the MCU, including the ancestral plane of the Black Panther mythology, the Duat and the Moon Knight, Valhalla and Thor Love and Thunder, and the Soul Realm of Infinity War, we get another depiction here when Rocket sees Lila again in Limbo. When Rocket wakes up, it's a beautiful moment that I did a whole video diving deep into. I highly recommend you watch that. So when Rocket wakes up, Peter and Groot hug him, and Groot snakes in more of his branches so that he can tug him in even closer. Now on Nowhere, Cosmo plays cards with Kraglin, Howard the Duck, voiced again by Seth Green, and Lloyd Kaufman, who played the Prisoner on the Kiln in Volume 1, and we see the Xandar Antiquities dealer from Volume 1, played by Christopher Fairbank, who had a great role in Andor and shared the screen for this iconic moment in Batman. What are you? I'm Batman. Peter plays the thuzz, this is the day, as he pilots the Bowie, and just like he did with Creep, Rocket sings along, Drax, Mantis, and Nebula run into some abelisks, one of the creatures we saw in Volume 2, which fed on Anulax batteries, a fact that Mantis reminds the group of here as she tames them. Peter plays the Beastie Boys' No Sleep Till Brooklyn, which is also referenced in Spider-Man No Way Home. No sleep till, bum bum, bum bum, Boston! Intergalactic has also been playing in trailers for the Marvels. <laughs> No Sleep Till Brooklyn is also featured in another Chris Pratt movie that came out this year, the Super Mario Brothers movie. Come on, let's go. Hey, wait up! This way. 
just kind of having a moment. Then we get a full two minute long unbroken fight take in this hallway, similar to what Daredevil does. And it's pretty cool. There's a ton of cool details during this battle. If you look closely, like the camera stays on Groot's branches as he extends them and punctures the hell spawn. One of those branches goes down to his throat and grows more to poke through his body. I actually had a chance to sit down with two of the frame store VFX artists who worked on this film, Alexi and Stefan. And Stefan explained how Groot's branches aren't stretching elastically because then they would have started to look like snakes with a mind of their own. Instead, they were unfurling pieces of himself that were always folded up and tucked inside of his chest. And therefore they're more rigid, making them feel like extensions of Groot himself and would have more impact when they hit stuff. Be sure to check out that interview because there's just so much cool stuff that I talked to those guys about. Mantis uses one of Groot's branches like a balance beam, swinging from it and landing on the guy's shoulders, then flipping him backward into that same branch. And you can actually hear the guard's bones break. <laughs> Then Rocket shoots a hell spawn, lands on Groot's shoulders, calling back that kill moment where they teamed up in the 2014 film, then runs along a branch, and then the camera swoops through the hole he just shot. Peter fights his way down the hallway and meets in the middle with Nebula. Peter disables three guards. Nebula gets her neck dislocated and her head just dangles from her back as she continues to fight. Gamora uses her God Slayer sword to sever the octopus captain in half, and Blurp happily hops on his sparking and spurting midsection stump. Mantis frees Lamb Shank, this freaky little hybrid. <laughs> Yes, you're welcome. Now, Lamb Shank is voiced by James Gunn, who also hilariously did the mocap for the character. Gunn said that he originally wrote this character for Stan Lee to play, since this movie was actually written before Stan Lee passed away. Rocket returns to his own cage chamber, and on the door, the label reads, Lumbus Wildlife Center, maybe Columbus Wildlife Center, TER 32190021, Origin North America, Kingdom Anomalia, Phylum Chordata, that refers to animals with backbones, genus Procyon, species Procyon Latour, common name raccoon. We actually heard this genus and species name spoken by David Hasselhoff in the Guardians Volume 2 song that played during that movie's credits. And there's an awesome music video where he says it. Getting down and dirty with a Procyon loader. So all the Guardians of the Galaxy team up to fight the High Evolutionary and Gamora peels back his skin, making him look very Red Scully, if you ask me. Paying off Peter Quill's promise that this was going to be a face off. The test animals all flock off the strip onto nowhere, Noah's Ark style, and Alexi from Frame Store pointed out a few other details that they threw into the scene. If you look closely, you can see a monkey on top of a taper, some turtles on top of another taper, and just animals on top of animals everywhere. Peter runs back for his drop Zoom. In volume one, he refused to leave the kiln without his Walkman and mixtape. Peter jumps out of the exploding ship into space. A lot of people were asking, why doesn't Peter Quill use his mask in this movie? I made a whole other video getting into that. Really, a lot of people forget that the mask was destroyed in Guardians of the Galaxy volume two, despite the fact that the Russo brothers and Infinity War and game gave Peter Quill his mask again, but in James Gunn's canonical history, Peter doesn't carry his mask with him. And I think James Gunn has tweeted that Peter Quill left the mask in his drawer on nowhere. And Adam Warlock rescues him, recreating Michelangelo's creation of Adam and saves Peter by flying him back into nowhere. Another thing in the VFX on this escape from nowhere, you definitely can see Drax carrying the High Evolutionary on his shoulder. The High Evolutionary does survive this. So there's an interesting moment where Gamora understands Groot and it's just surprised as the audience is. And it's so sweet that Gamora in just a short amount of time has been able to understand Groot vocal variances. James Gunn has said that Groot doesn't have a universal language translator, but you do come to understand its language through enough time connecting with him. This explains why Rocket is the only one who can understand him in the first movie. I'm Groot. Yeah, you said that. But the other Guardians can once they've started to act like a team. I am Groot. Whoa! Whoa. Hey! This version of Gamora is gradually warming to the Guardians and understanding Groot shows that she's making progress. We, the audience, have been on an incredible journey with these characters, so it just makes sense that we can finally understand Groot when he says, I love you guys. We are part of the team. Even though if you look closely, Groot doesn't mouth the words, I am Groot. He really does vocalize, I love you guys. But you know, our empathy with him just causes our eyes to see his lips form the words that we hear. So the group discusses going their separate ways and they're standing in the circle. A bunch of jackasses standing in a circle. All the standing except Rocket. So Peter leaves Rocket the Zune with a note written on one of the ALF trading cards that we saw earlier in the movie. He plays Florence and the Machines, the dog days are over. Florence Welch, the band's lead singer, posted a video to TikTok saying she cried throughout the movie, but really lost it when her song came on. Same Florence, same. The song itself is very appropriate for this moment. Welch has said that it's about embracing things that you used to be scared of, like looking in the mirror and not feeling sad. This is a perfect summation of what Rocket learns in this movie, to love himself despite his past. It's very fitting that he starts the movie listening to a song with lyrics, I'm a creep, I'm a weirdo, and ends the movie listening to this hopeful, uplifting track. One of the quotes in the Marvel logo at the beginning of the film was Drax explaining that he's not a being who dances, but here he gives in and gets down 
down. I'm so proud of him. Look how far he's come. Peter returns to Missouri and his grandfather played once again by Greg Henry who played him in the 2014 film and in a cameo in volume two. Now in the mid credit scene, we get the new Guardians of the Galaxy lineup including Rocket, Alpha Groot with a King Groot crowned head, Kraglin, Cosmo, Blurp, Adam Warlock, and Phyla Vell. Rocket plays the new team, Red Bones, come and get your love, which appeared in the opening scene of the first movie. And then in the post credit scene, Peter wears a t-shirt for a freaky cereal. This is a breakfast cereal from the 70s with goofy cartoon mascots. It also had a short-lived relaunch in 1986 where the mascots were depicted as aliens. Peter's grandfather reads a paper with the headline, Alien Abduction, Kevin Bacon Shares All, a reference to the plot of the Guardians holiday special. There's also a shout out on there to James Gunn's dog, Lola. And we end on the text, the legendary Star-Lord will return. James Gunn said in an interview, quote, Chris and I forever have talked about how great it would be to be able to do a legendary Star-Lord movie. A story with Star-Lord on Earth trying to adapt to the environment of Earth in the same way that somebody else might try to adapt to the alien environment of outer space. He's a fish out of water in just kind of regular water, so I can't wait to see it. Legendary Star-Lord is a 12-issue comic series that deals with Peter Quill leaving the Guardians for a solo adventure. The Peter in the comics is a very different backstory than the Peter in the MCU, so we probably wouldn't be seeing a note-for-note -note adaptation of that series, but rather another Star-Lord solo adventure. And yes, again, James Gunn confirmed on Twitter that the High Evolutionary did in fact survive and was locked up in a prison cell on Nowhere that we see in a deleted scene. James Gunn said it would be, quote, silly and hollow for Rocket to refuse to kill him, only to have him die on the exploding ship. Whether we'll see him again is anyone's guess, but given Marvel's penchant for unexpected returns, I'd say we will. There's also a good chance we might see the new iteration of the Guardians of the Future, possibly in the wrap-up of the Multiverse Saga, given how powerful Kang is and how hard he'll be to defeat. Odds are they're gonna need every hand on deck for that. And who knows, we've also seen some clues in the Marvels that we might see a new cosmic lineup of heroes called the Annihilators. And some of these members of the Guardians could be part of that, or Peter Quill or Mantis. We'll see. Hey, thank you so much for watching this re-breakdown. Please support all three channels in the New Rockstars Network. You can follow me on all social media at EA Voss. Follow New Rockstars. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.